I could stand down here. If you can't see my knees knocking, then we're in good shape. It is truly an honor and a privilege to be with you here tonight, and um, this is certainly the largest congregation I've ever spoke to before. I'm kind of overwhelmed, to be honest. Uh, the congregation where I speak at is about 75 uh, in attendance. Uh, we had at one time gotten up to about 120, and we really thought we were somebody, so to speak. But we've had uh, kids grow, go off to college, some get, getting, getting married, and uh, moving off and different things, so we run about 75 now, but we are on fire for the Lord, and we want to, uh, to grow the congregation, and we are working toward that. As Brother Rob mentioned, uh, Brother Jack has been there several times, and I love and appreciate him and Sister Becky and the work that they do and, and the labor in the kingdom, and we uh, welcome him anytime he can come. When Rob uh, talked to me about the series here, uh, he asked me what I wanted to preach on. And he said, you know, basically anything related to the home. And as I contemplated that thought for just a moment, I realized that there was only one choice for me personally, and that is the topic of time. So if you want to put a title on my lesson tonight, it's called Don't Let Time Get Away. Time is a precious commodity. It's something that each of us are only allotted a certain amount of. Back in the book of Genesis, at chapter 1, God created the heavens and the earth. In the very beginning, that is, of time, God started time. And time has never ceased since that moment. Time will not cease until the Lord returns. The poet Henry Longfellow said, What is time? The shadow on the dial, the striking of the clock, day and night, summer and winter, months, years, centuries. These are all but the outward signs, the measure of time, not itself. Time is something that we measure, but it's not. Anything that we measure it with is not time. One person said, the bad news is that time flies. The good news is that you're the pilot's. So if you're the pilot of your time tonight, how are you navigating or how are you managing the time that's been given to you? And that's a question that we all need to ask ourselves. We need to ask ourselves every day, how am I utilizing the time that God has given me? And as it pertains to the family, as it pertains to the home, how are we utilizing that time? I see a lot of young families here tonight, and that's a wonderful thing. It's, it's a great sign of a growing congregation. And I want to encourage you, I'm 51. I've got a son that's uh, about to be 17 in September. And if you have young children, I want to encourage you from as much as I possibly can. Don't let time get away with those children. Don't let time get away with your spouse. Time is precious. Too often, we are lackadaisical at best, if you will in how we deal with time in the home. Today, society tells us, you know, you need to spend time on the computer, this thing called Facebook. I find myself guilty of this. You know, how much time do we look on Facebook and we're investigating, we're looking at and, and uh, going through someone else's life? We're worried about what they're doing, what's going on in their lives, as opposed to what's going on in our own. Time is precious. Every moment that we spend on the computer, laptop, whatever it is, and we're on Facebook looking at everyone else's lives, is time that we've lost with our own family. We're lackadaisical. To help us account for time tonight, I have three things that I want to look at, three elements, if you will, or three areas. Purpose, priority, and plan. That's the three P's. So don't let time get away by having a purpose, number one. And I want to encourage you tonight to think on these things, and you can probably come up with a lot more uh, points or elements than, than I've got down. I just looked at my own self, and as I told Rob when I preach, I preach to self first. And I am one of those emotional preachers sometimes, and I will get choked up. Because when I look at God's Word and I'm preaching God's Word, 
and I examine my own life like we're supposed to do, to examine ourselves if we're in the faith, to examine ourselves if we're in the truth, I look at my life and I say, I fall short. I realize there are days that I do things that I could, uh, shouldn't be doing when I could be spending time with my wife. There are days when I do things I could be spending time with my son. Sure, we need time to self. But it's those times that we do things that don't have a purpose. In the military, I served uh, in the Army. From the, uh, <clears throat> from the time I got in to the time I got out, every day was move with a purpose. Move like you've got a purpose in life. It might be moving a pile of rocks from one place to another five foot away, but you do it with a purpose. You move with a purpose. The reason they ingrain that into your mind is this. When you get on the field of combat, you better have a purpose. When you're told to drop, you better drop. There's a purpose for everything. In the book of Ephesians, chapter 4, verses 14 and six, through 16, verse 15 is the one I want to pay attention to. But if you want to turn there with me for just a moment, Ephesians chapter 4, Fourteen through 16. That we should no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men and the cunning craftiness by which they lie in wait to deceive. Verse 15. But speaking the truth in love may grow us. Underline that in your Bibles if you take note or highlight. Grow us. We'll come back to that in a minute. In all things into him who is the head of Christ, from whom the whole body, joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share, causes growth, good word to underline again, of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Now, I asked you to underline or highlight the word grow. We think about growing. Certainly, you can see in this congregation here, children who are growing. I was out there uh, with the brethren and a young lady come in and she runs up to her granddaddy. A little tight. It won't be long till granddaddy won't be able to pick her up anymore because she'll be up to the ear. There'll be no more of those days because she grows. But I want you to see the purpose in verse 15. Our purpose as Christians, our purpose as individuals is to grow into him in all things. Brethren, our purpose in this life is not to enjoy earthly things. Our purpose in this life is to grow in Christ. If you're not growing, what are you doing? Dying. If you're not growing, if you're not uh, making progress, you're sitting stagnant and you're dying. You show me a congregation with a good leadership, and I'll show you a congregation that's growing. You show me a congregation where you have individuals that will dive into God's word and study to show themselves approved to God, not to man. I'll show you a congregation that's growing. It's because they've got a purpose. In Ephesians 4 there, our purpose is to become mature in Christ. So how do we do that? Well, number one, we need to be able to receive his salvation. We need to receive what he has offered to us. We must understand that Christ became the propitiation of our sins. We must understand that God so loved the world that he gave his son. And his son came to this earth willingly. As you recall, back in the garden of Gethsemane, Christ prayed, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, let not my will, but thy will be done. He loved us enough to give himself. We've got to receive his salvation. We've got to be useful in his service. That means we're going to have to have a purpose. And our purpose is to be Christ-like in character. Our culture today, however, disagrees to this concept and this idea. Most Americans believe that their main purpose is to be happy and or successful. 
to grab all the gusto that they possibly can while up on this earth since they only go around once. You're born and then you begin the process of dying, if you will, or you will reach that point in life where you will die. So you may as well as grab everything that you possibly can. Enjoy life. I'm not opposed to enjoying life. I'm not opposed to having things and being able to go and do things. I'm not opposed to that. But the world teaches that's all you need to be involved with. That's all that you need to have a purpose for. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. As wonderful as these things are, maturity in Christ is our goal. It's our purpose. We cannot let time get away by not instructing our children about the greatest purpose in this life. That is living for our Lord. Don't let time get away and not take every opportunity to instruct, teach, and love our family members. Don't let time get away to teach and instruct and enjoy Christians who are your brethren. Don't let time get away. Have a purpose to restore the airing. There must be that purpose. In Isaiah chapter 55, if you want to turn over there, verses 6 and 7. Isaiah 55, 6 and 7. Seek ye the Lord while he may be found. If it's in the, in the reading there, it says, Seek the Lord while he may be found. That certainly should indicate to us that there will come a time when there will be a place, there will be a time, there will be a situation, if you will, however you want to word it, in which you cannot find the Lord. He is available at this point in time, but the time will come when you cannot seek him, when you cannot find him. Call ye upon him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake his way and the unrighteous man his thoughts and let him return unto the Lord. And he will have mercy upon him and to our God. For he will abundantly pardon. Verse 8. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. Our thoughts are not the purpose that we're here for. Our ways are are not the purpose that we're here for. God's ways and his thoughts are our purpose. In Ecclesiastes chapter 12 and verse 13, I think the scripture is very clear for this. Let us hear the conclusion of the whole matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. Why? Why should we fear God? Why should we keep his commandments? Because this is the whole duty of man. The whole of man, that is the completeness, the sum, if you will. This is the whole of man. Fear God and keep his commandments. And when we do so, we realize, I've got a purpose in life. I've got a purpose for being upon this earth. I have a purpose that God has given me. In Matthew 28, verses 19 through 20, we have what we would call the Great Commission. Most of us know it. Go ye therefore and teach all nations. Purpose. Our purpose to go and to teach. Christ himself said, I came to seek and to save the lost. I didn't come upon earth to have fun and enjoy my friends and ride around on the boat and fish or whatever it may have been back in those days. My purpose was to come and to seek and save the lost. Our purpose is the same according to Matthew, that great commission. Christ telling his disciples, go. There's your purpose, Go. Teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Ghost. Teaching, here's another purpose, them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the world. Our purpose is to study God's Word, 2 Timothy 2.15. Study or be diligent in New King James. Why should we study? The purpose is to show ourselves approved unto God. That is... When you look at it, it's to take ourselves and to present ourselves before God. Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, would give us the indication of this very thought or idea. Where the Apostle Paul says, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God. Watch it now, which is your reasonable service. And then in verse 2, he says, Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. It's our purpose. Our purpose is to commit ourselves to be a living sacrifice. 
Our purpose is to present ourselves to be approved by God, not by the world. We have a purpose, and until we know, and until we understand our purpose, nothing in this life will fall in place. When our purpose is established in the home, then our home will be in place. Too many times we don't have a purpose in the home. Too many times our homes today are just floating along. They're drifting aimlessly. No direction to go. It moves. Every day it moves. But what's the purpose of the home? We must not let get time get away with our purpose. Purpose is not about self. Too many families and too many homes, it's about self. It's about my needs, my wants. The Lord never intended it to be that way. In the book of Ephesians, fathers are told not to provoke the children to wrath, but bring them up in the way they should go. We're to instruct our children in ways of righteousness. The Old Testament would reveal to us that the law was to be discussed daily. When you rise up, when you lie down, any time of the day you're together, discuss these things. Discuss the Lord. Purpose is not about self and the family. Purpose is to be made perfectly clear for the family to see. And that purpose we would see in the book of Joshua chapter 24. You choose today who you want to serve. But for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Purpose. Number two tonight for don't let time get away. Have a priority. So we have purpose, and if we have purpose, then we're ready for that next step, aren't we? We're ready for the next step that would come into the home, and that is priority, prioritizing. A lot of people struggle with this. I know I struggle with it many times. When I sit down and I'm trying to make out my to-do list, if you will, or I'm looking in my planner and I'm trying to write things in of what I want to do and things I want to accomplish, I struggle many times in prioritizing. We would call this perhaps procrastination. We wait to the last minute to put things together. But really the scriptures are very clear that we must prioritize. The number one priority we see in three verses, three texts, different texts. In Matthew twenty-two thirty-seven, 37, Mark 12, 30, and Luke 10, 27. They all state basically the same thing, but I want to read all three of them to you very quickly. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy hearts and with all thy soul and with all thy mind. Priority. Mark chapter 12 at verse 30. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy hearts and with all thy soul and with all thy mind and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. In Luke 10 and verse 27, And he answering said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy hearts with all thy soul, with all thy strength, and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. Priority is not upon self. Priority in the family is to love your family members more than you love self. Priority in the family is to play self last. Priority in the family is to esteem others better than yourself. Priority in the family is to sit down at night and to say God is at the center of this family. God is the core of this home. And when we put our priorities in line, God will bless that home. Once we know our purpose, we can understand our priority. Priority just means knowing things which are most important and which ones are less important. In Matthew 6 and verse 33, a very familiar passage to a lot of us. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Brethren, I'm afraid that today we don't stress this enough in our homes. We prioritize work because we prioritize things. 
Matthew 6, 33 goes against that mindset, that way of thinking. When we seek God first, the things that are necessities of life will be given to us. We don't have to worry about food or clothes or places to live. God's going to provide it. For many of us, that's a hard thing to understand and comprehend. So we work and we work and we work because the things that we want and we think we have to have, we got to pay for them. And we owe every, ma every person and his brother something. Would it be hard to give up everything? Sure it would. We have an example of that, a perfect example in the Scripture. A young man came up to the Lord and he said, What do I need to do in order to have eternal life? Christ told him, if I may paraphrase, you sell all what you got. All these worldly goods you have, you sell them, you give to the poor. That old boy had money, you know. He had things. And I can only imagine what he felt whenever Christ told him that. And I can only imagine he probably scratching his head going, I'm not real sure who you are, but I think you've lost your mind. Uh, do you realize who you're talking to? Do you realize what I have? Do you realize the material possessions that I have? The power that I would have? Sell it. Give it to the poor and follow them. The scripture gives us the answer of what happened with this young man because it says he went away sorrowful. He could not let go of the priorities he had in life. He couldn't change his priorities with himself or with his home if he had family. A man by the name of Charles Schwab and Ivy Lee. Schwab was the president of Bethlehem Steel. Lee was a consultant of his and was given the usual challenge from Schwab. He said, you show me a way to get more things done with my time. I'm a busy man, basically, and I need to get more things done. I need to take care of more items. So you show me a way as my consultant of how I can do things, do more things. Well, Lee's suggestion worked. He handed Schwab a sheet of paper with the plan written on it. And here's what he put on this piece of paper. And he told Schwab, he said, when you get this, he said, you pay me what you think it's worth. Schwab was instructed, he said, write down the most important task you have to do tomorrow. Number them in order of importance. In other words, prioritize. When you arrive in the morning, begin at number one and stay on it until it's completed. Recheck your priorities then, and then begin with number two, and then to number three and four, and on, so on down the line. I want you to also take that, and I want you to pass it on to those who work under you. The same instructions. And when you do this, and however long you want to do it, when, when you feel satisfied, if it works, fine, if it doesn't, fine, but you just send me whatever you think it's worth. Well, time went by. And within five years, the Bethlehem Steel Corporation was the biggest independent steel producer in the world within five years from one simple piece of paper. Mr. Lee received a check from Mr. Schwab for $25,000, saying this was the most profitable lesson he had ever learned. Priorities. Brethren, what is your priorities tonight within the home? What do you place priority on with your children? What do you put priority on with your spouse? When our priorities are not healthy and clear, many times we attempt more things than we should and never really accomplish anything. There are many people today that play Christian. Within the home and outside the home. Within the church and outside the church. They play Christian because they don't have priorities in order. Priorities begin within the home. 
It begins with mom and dad sitting down at night with children and with each other and opening God's word and studying it together. It begins by children seeing mom and dad holding hands and praying to the Almighty God. It begins with parents having the priority to say nothing is going to come before God, not even you. When we get those priorities in line, we won't have to worry about the next generation. The next generation will take care of its own because the priorities have been set in order. When priorities are out of line, it causes stress, doesn't it? Think about your own life. And I, I've been in the boat I'm about to tell you about. But what about finances? That's a terrible thing, isn't it? I hate the word finance. Sometimes I hate the word money. Because it seems like there's never enough of it. Why? Because too often we have priorities out of line. The things we think we need, the things we think we have to have, in order to keep up with the Joneses, I hope nobody in here has the last name of Jones. <laughs> in order to keep up with the honeycuts, we, we go out and do things, and we prioritize differently. We don't place the priorities the way they should be. There are things that are important in life, though. When we consider time and not letting time get away as we prioritize things, I want you to understand that there is time for things in life. There is enough time for the important things in life. What would I classify as important? Perhaps you and your spouse taking a trip down a back country road, enjoying some scenery, enjoying some time to, to talk with one another. What about for the family to walk along the beach and stroll along and pick up seashells? Certainly a priority. What about teaching our children how to fly a kite or how to fish or how to hunt? There is a time to doze in a hammock with your spouse, a time to sit on the front porch and hold hands. There's time to play fetch with Rover. All this can only happen, though, if priority is in line. Now, what doesn't fall into priorities? Things that don't matter. And I want to suggest a few of these to you tonight, and you may come up with some of your own. But when it comes to the family and it comes to not letting time get away with the family, here are some time killers that could be better spent with our family. Things that we could eliminate thinking that they're priorities. Things which are not beneficial. What about unplanned TV viewing? If I asked for a show of hands, I bet a lot of us would raise our hands. What do I mean by unplanned TV viewing? Well, that's when you come in from work and uh, you realize, well, the kitchen needs to be cleaned, or I need to wash clothes, or I need to do this, or I need to do that. Maybe the yard needs mowing it. But instead, we find that couch or that recliner, and we plant ourselves in it. The TV comes on, and we watch the news, and we watch gun smoke, and we watch whatever it is. Unplanned TV time that kills time that we could spend with family. It kills time that we could be throwing the ball for Rover. It kills time that we could be sitting on the front porch holding hands with our wife and our husband. It kills time when we could just take our kids and go down a little, little creek or something and fish for a little while. What about gossip sessions? Men and women. It's not just women that's guilty of this. We come in, we get on the phone, and it's like, hey, Sue, did you hear about it? Or, hey, Rob, did you hear about this? And the gossip begins, and... Five minutes goes by, ten minutes. Before long, an hour, and before long, two hours, and you've done nothing, you've accomplished nothing, but tear someone down because of gossip. That's not priority. What about plotting revenge? We come in fuming from work, or something has taken place in our lives, and instead of utilizing the time wisely to be with our family and to to associate with them and have that time with them, we want to plot the revenge that we want to have for that individual that made us mad that day. We can spend minutes, we can spend hours plotting a revenge. What about the pity parties? Oh, woe is me. That's not a priority. 
The book of James says we're to humble ourselves. That is, we are to put ourselves or esteem ourselves lower than everyone else. And in so doing, you become a servant, and servants are uplifted by the Lord. Humble yourselves inside the Lord, and he will lift you up. It doesn't say to have your pity party, to wallow in your own, your own um, whatever it is, whatever happened to you that day, whatever troubles you might have. Another thing, perhaps it's a, not a priority, is we cry over past mistakes. If there's anyone in this room tonight that's got past mistakes, I'm one of them. I told Rob on the way over here that when I get an opportunity to speak to young people, I can relate to them. Many of you have probably been in the military, so you know exactly where I'm coming from. I was wayward for a while. I went off the deep end to where I was smoking and I was drinking and I was doing things I shouldn't be doing. I was a wayward Christian and had the Lord returned during that time frame, I'd busted hell wide open. I'd split it down the middle. There would have been no hope for me. I understand. Past mistakes, though, they're a time killer. You dwell upon them, it does no good. It's not a priority. The Apostle Paul said, those things that are behind me, I forget about. I press forward to the goal. I press forward to that higher calling. I press forward to the cross. I forget those things that are behind me. Paul persecuted Christians. He wreaked havoc upon the church. He drove people out of their homes. He had to forget about it, though. He realized that he was a chosen vessel for the Lord. Don't let time get away in not teaching and train our children. In Proverbs 22, verses 3 through 6, a prudent man foreseeth the evil and hides, hides himself, but the simple pass on and are punished. By humility and the fear of the Lord are riches and honor and life. Thorns and snares are in the way of the perverse, but he that doeth, doth keep his soul shall be far from them. And then the last verse is one that we understand. Train up a child in the way he should go, and when he's old, he will not depart from it. Prioritize for your children. We can go to Psalms chapter 127, and we can see where children are heritage from the Lord. The man that has his quiver full of them, he's not to be ashamed. In Matthew chapter 18 and verse 6, Whoever shall offend one of the little ones. I want to show, the, show you the blessing of children and how great of a blessing it is and why we as parents need to prioritize with our children. Whoso shall offend one of these little ones, talking about children, this is where Christ called a little one over, which believe in me, it were better for him that a millstone were hanged about his neck and he were dropped into the depths of the sea. Mothers and dads, Children are priority. And when we cause them to stumble, we cause them to fall, that a word fend in that verse carries that very idea. When we cause them to stumble, cause them to fall, we cause them to apostatize, we may as well put a brick around our neck and be cast into the sea. The last point tonight, I didn't think I'd get through all this. Is don't get, let time get away. We've got to have a plan. A plan within the home. He who fails to plan, plans to fail. Paul gave a very similar advice to the Ephesians. As far back as I can remember in my days growing up, there was a soap opera on that was called Days of Our Lives. And when the soap opera would come on, the program's theme was like sands through an hourglass, so are the days of our lives. Probably some of you older ladies remember that show. You may have sat and watched it and you just boo-hoo and think, oh, this is just such a tragedy. The psalmist said, this is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Have a plan. The plan is to rejoice. Very quickly, I want to read you some words that deal with this plan. 
This is from a song that perhaps some of us will know. My child arrived just the other day. He came to the world in the usual way, but there were planes to catch and bills to pay. He learned to walk while I was away. And he was talking for I knew it. And as he grew, he'd say, I'm going to be like you, Dad. You know I'm going to be like you. My son turned 10 the other day. He said, thanks for the ball, Dad. Come on, let's play. Can you teach me how to throw? I said, not today. I've got a lot to do. He said, that's okay. And he walked away, but his smile never dimmed. He said, I'm going to be like him. Yeah, you know I'm going to be like him. Well, he came home from college the other day. So much like a man, I just had to say, Son, I'm proud of you. Can you sit for a while? He shook his head and said with a smile, What I'd really like, Dad, is to borrow the car keys. See you later. Can I have them, please? I've long since retired and my son's moved on. I called him up just the other day. I said, I'd like to see you if you don't mind. He said, I'd love to, Dad, if I could find the time. You see, my new job's a hassle, and the kids got the flu. But it's sure nice talking to you, Dad. It's been sure nice talking to you. And as I hung up the phone, it occurred to me, he'd grown up just like me. My boy was a man just like me. That's from the song, The Cat's in the Cradle and the Silver Spoon. As I was putting my lesson together with, with that, tears filled my eyes. You think about purpose, you think about priority, and you think about plans. Don't let time get away from spending time with your family. Don't let time get away from demonstrating your love for one another. Don't let time get away from missing the little things with huge impacts. Don't let time get away with planning your family's salvation. The more time we spend doing things which don't aid to eternity in heaven pushes our loved ones one step closer to eternity in hell. And I'll finish up with the invitation in a minute. Thank you.